Welcome to the latest See Me podcast on a biblical view of the economy. My name is Graham Leach. I'm joined today by Andrew Lilko, Managing Director of Europe Economics, a Daily Telegraph commentator, and most definitely one of Britain's leading economists and, and clearest thinkers on the economy generally. And today we're going to find out about what he thinks a biblical view of the economy is, or indeed, in my first question, is there a biblical view on the economy? Andrew, welcome. Please um, give us some of your thoughts on it. Is there a biblical view on the economy to start out? I, I think the Bible has quite a lot to say that's relevant to think about the economy. Uh, a first point that I would make is that uh, in the Bible, we, um, we, the things that we own, that we have, we have under God. So God gives us everything. And uh, so that's the we have a position of humility with respect to God. But after our humility with respect to God, then we own ourselves. So we own our labor, uh, we own our work, and as people who own ourselves, we um, are then own property. And of course, the, uh, it's one of the Ten Commandments that, that protects the private property from theft. One of the most important start points is the recognition of self-ownership and of the ownership of private property. Other important biblical principles uh, so uh, in, the, in the Bible, we to let our yes be yes. Uh, we shouldn't need even to be bound by oaths. So we, sh uh, as Christians, we must keep our promises. That um, should facilitate uh, the um, existence of contracts and of covenants and of uh, lending and other kinds of things like that. Another biblical principle I think that's quite important is that, in, that we should enter into our dealings in a spirit of friendly collaboration rather than seeking domination. Um, so we, it, the relationship which we have with other individuals is that of um, submission to other Christians and of friendly collaboration with non-Christians. And uh, so when you enter into a deal, you should be entering into any kind of trade with a view to both sides gaining rather than you extracting the absolute maximum. Um, also, that you, shouldn't, you should have a care that the deals that you engage with are to the benefit of the other party. So you shouldn't be entering into a deal if you believe that the other party will lose um, out of that deal, even if they think that they might gain from it. And if you have good reason to suppose that they're going to lose, uh, then they're, they're mistaken and they're going to lose. You shouldn't um, do that because that's uh, uh, unkind and harmful to them. Uh, uh, I think also there are other biblical principles which are important. We should be careful of our own positions when we have vested power. So for example, if we were to have significant market power, um, we should be careful that we didn't abuse any dominant position that we had uh, through exploitation if we were monopolists or monopolists. And I think that we should um, be careful of the exercising of um, dominant positions by others as well. So those are uh, just a few, but there are, uh, there are lots of biblical principles, I think, relevant to the economy. You mentioned property rights at the beginning and the importance of that. I mean, you, you could argue that there were two commandments on property rights because that's what shall not covet as well. And yet we have a society which seems to covet everything and wants to redistribute income. Where do you think the Bible stands on redistribution? I think that the Bible does uh, instruct us that we should, if, if other people don't have things, then we should help them with that uh, and not necessarily expect anything in return. So we're told to uh, lend to people who, um, without, uh, who don't have anything without expecting anything in return. Um, of course, for quite a while, people thought that because you were supposed to lend to people who lacked and expect nothing in return, that meant that you shouldn't lend to people at all. And we, latterly, we learned that that was a mistake. That, it, it, uh, But I think that that's an, there's an important principle there as well in that when people developed, so it, uh, I mean, it's really Melanchthon and Eck who made the key uh, the intellectual leaps, but though everybody thinks of it as being Calvin, um, the, when people shift to the idea that you should it's legitimate to lend money at interest. We got sucked into an idea that came that came along from later, really from Bentham, uh, that that there was no no moral concerns about lending at interest at all. And I don't think that's correct. You should still bear in mind um, a number of important moral principles in lending. So, if, a first one is that if you're lending, if you're lending to people who are in no position to repay, you shouldn't expect to get it back. That's a, that's an act of charity rather than of trade. If I am lending to, so I need to understand the basis in which I'm lending to somebody. I need to assess. And if I'm going to lend to them on a commercial basis, I should be only lending to them if I think that they can pay me back. 
because if I'm lending to them under those kinds of circumstances, I'm demanding a promise from them to repay. If I lend to you believing that you can't repay, then I'm inducing you to break a promise. Inducing promise breaking is um, wrong and it's clearly wrong under um, uh, Christian principles, it's wrong under almost every model system really. Um, uh, but uh, a second principle I think is important there is if I um, lend to somebody who's unable to repay me, another thing that I am, am in effect ending up doing potentially is stealing money from their other creditors. They may owe money to somebody else. Yeah. And if I make them default, then they're going to be in less of a position to pay uh, other creditors. So um, that's, that should also be a concern. There's a concern for the welfare of the individual, but there's also a, a concern for the welfare of the other people who are in the web of commercial relationships with them. And as Christians, we should bear in mind those wider moral connections which we have. We shouldn't just think that we're in the position I want and I get out of this thing that's in front of me now. And that's a very kind of anti-Christian principle that applies in lots of things, you know, marriage and other kinds of things as well. And um, that, that, that we need to bear in mind a, a wider web of relations rather than just the, just the opportunity that lies before us. You've broadened that discussion here, and I, I want to raise a topic now, which actually is a bit of a curveball. I haven't mentioned it to you, but we, I'd be really fascinated to know what you think. What would your would your view be of fractional reserve banking from a, a biblical perspective? Would you say that's counterfeiting? I don't believe it's counterfeiting. No, I, I think um, there's nothing there's nothing illegitimate about fractional reserve banking in principle. Um, the problem with fractional reserve banking arises when people think that you. Um, because it, it is by its nature a risk-taking activity. Uh, when I put money, a deposit, in a fractional reserve bank, I am engaging in effectively a kind of a loan to the bank. It's not my money anymore. I've lent. People in their heads have the idea that when they deposit money in a bank, it's like if I deposit my suit as dry cleaners, it still fundamentally belongs to me and I should be able to take it back anytime I like. But that's not what a bank deposit in a fractional reserve bank is. I'm not just storing my money there. I'm lending the money to the bank to do various things with it. And if the bank defaults, then the bank defaults. That's like I lent money to a chip shop or I lent money to a software company. That sometimes you're going to get defaults and they won't be able to pay you back. And it shouldn't be that you say, well, I was just leaving my money there. It's not. I wasn't actually lending my money to the bank, so the government or somebody should come and step in and um, uh, make sure that I can't possibly lose any money. It's a fundamentally risk-involving activity, depositing money in a, in, in a, a fractional reserve bank. And as such, it's not any more morally legitimate for the government to bail out to, uh, government, uh, bank depositors than it would be for them to bail out the people who lend money to a chip shop or a software company. It's um, it's a, it's it's. It's an improper activity. And going along with that, I think that if you want a society in which um, people are able to just store money, which perhaps you should, right? Perhaps yeah. they should have a, um, an opportunity, some warehouse, a yeah. way to do that, then you need to have institutions in which they can do that. You, mu you mustn't think that uh, I, because I need to do that, therefore, the answer has to be that the state has to um, uh, pro uh, provide some kind of improper a distortion by these other institutions. What the, one of the consequences of the um, bailouts of fractional reserve banks and depositors in fractional reserve banks is that you create a, a moral cancer at the heart of the entire capitalist system. Banks in, in our kind of system are the m largest single allocators of capital in the system. The largest single source of capital which they have is their deposits. So you're saying then that you're, you're morally damaging the largest single source of deposits, but the largest allocators of capital in the system. And that's going to mean that all of the kind of theories of justice that we have about how market economies can be just and just allocation and everything like that are all bust from the bottom up because at the very, at the very core of the system, the deposit in the fractional reserve bank, you've made it morally illegitimate. And what you're doing then is that you're making a society in which people get some kind of wealth and then they use their political influence because they go and they'll complain to the government or vote, or vote against them or whatever if they haven't bailed out. They use that to protect, to protect their uh, wealth once they have it from, it from risk. So they're then going to take high interest rates because it's a, a fractional reserve banks are naturally risk-taking activity in, in periods of uh, when things are going to go well. And then they're going to use the state to bail them out when things go badly. That, that's 
not the job. That's not the job of the of the government, uh, and I don't think it's the morally legitimate at all. What would a biblical response have been to the two thousand and eight crisis? How would you have done it differently if you were operating under a biblical model? Well, I think there are a number of things to say about on a, on a, 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 in terms of biblical principles. I think one one important biblical principle is that of economic justice. That and the, the key, the most fundamental point of economic justice is that um, the, the state doesn't exist to keep rich people rich. Uh, I think it's the, it's the that's the the single, you know, the foolish, perhaps, the state does not exist to keep foolish or mistaken rich people who make mistakes rich. Um, uh, and so I think that that should have been a key start point. I think that um, the recognition that, um, a recognition that what we have in the world is, so the, the gifts of, that God provides in terms of um, our talents and the things that we do with them and the things that we create with them and all the the the, the, the structure of everything. That's the that's the actual wealth, not the denomination of it in pounds and so on, and not also who happens to have it at any moment in time. I think that it goes along with the idea of my owning private property that when I engage in commercial relations with it, I can't claim the things which aren't truly mine anymore. When something is my property, it is my property. And when it isn't my property, it isn't my property. Uh, and I can't, and saying that uh, I'm going to claim things that aren't my property is mine because I ought to have them for some um, peculiar reason, which has nothing to do with that kind of justice at all. It's not, it's not quite theft. But it's something quite akin to it. People get tempted into falling for a confusion. They think there's a sort of arrogance. They think that um, the cleverness of people and our economic systems and our, the way we denominate things is what makes actual wealth. But the wealth is there, right? And what we do is that there's some um, property relations and so on that allocate it, some of, and that. They sit on top of fundamentally moral relations. That, that, might, be, that might be an important thing to, to, to grasp in terms of a biblical um, concept versus a non-biblical concept. If you think that, because some people have the idea that actually there isn't any fundamentally private ownership. What there is is a collective we. And this isn't just right and left, right? That, that some, some people on the right basically take the same idea as well. What they think is that all property, they have a kind of Hobbesian picture where um, or, or, there's only the state saying, you get to keep this and he gets to keep that. And there's an allocation. And that doesn't have to be, a, that could be a left-wing point of view, but it could also be a right-wing point of view. That the, that the only source of um, uh, private property ownership is the exercise of state power, the allocation. There's a, there's a, you either have the idea that uh, the kind of left idea might be that we own it all and you get to possess it in some way which is useful for all of us. Yeah. Or, it, or alternatively, it might be that um, you get to have it and the only sense in which the, the, there's meaning to you owning it is that the power, the state power, deems that you're the one that owns it. But I don't think either of those is a Christian uh, attitude. I think that the Christian attitude is that we fundamentally own ourselves uh, and the fruits of our um, work, combined with things that other people give, gifts that we have, gifts is a, is a legitimate uh, Christian idea, um, or trade or other kinds of things that other people have given us, then constitute our property. And those are fundamentally moral relations. As I said, the, the idea of property exists in the Ten Commandments. And when we have these um, legal relationships, by and large, you can't always do it. Right? Some of them, some moral relations, many moral relations have to exist out with legal structure. But when it comes to property relations, by and large, the um, legal relations should be seeking to map onto, albeit imperfectly, they should be seeking to map onto the moral relations which underlie them. There's a kind of 
natural justice, which the illegal justice is seeking to pursue. It's trying to create the economically, naturally just world. And I think that that's, that that's an important distinction because then we care about things. If, if you take that attitude, then you care about things like who really owns a bank deposit? Right? Who's the one that truly owns it? If, if all that you think it's, something's about is, oh, well, what's the legal situation and what can power, who has the political power to exercise and to, I mean, in the end, at the end of the day, if you control enough of the state power, that you then get to have the deposit at the, at the end of the story, then you own it all the time, right? Where, but if there's a, if you think that the job of the the law here is to enforce the underlying moral relationship, then I think you would take a different view. You'd also, I think, you'd probably have taken a more stoic or a philosophical um, response to bad things happening, uh, rather than the idea that, um, that somehow the state must avoid every kind of catastrophe. It's somehow its job to prevent anything bad ever happening um, to anybody. And, you know, I don't think that that's the state's job at all. I, I would agree, but I think one of the, maybe the, one of the biggest shifts in, in my working lifetime um, has been that, that shift where it's, uh, the collapse of communism was the beginning of my career, I think, back. And then, pe and then there was more of a mentality that you don't look to the state First of all, you look to yourselves, and and, um, and that that was never massive in the sense that it dominated to the exclusion of, of all other thinking. There was always a very collective mentality, e even in the, in the in the market economies. Um, but one senses with progressive secularization over the last thirty years or so, and with certain major events, the financial crisis, the pandemic. That now the first port of call for every problem is to look to government. And it's difficult to see how that reverses uh, absent some sort of re religious revival, um, because th that mentality is there now. And from a biblical perspective, how does that make you feel? Because it's because that isn't a bit, the biblical model is most definitely not turned to the government for, at every corner. Yeah, well. I mean, I would say that as Christians, we um, should, in the first instance, we should look to our own structures. So we have moral duties to help other people around us that aren't, that whatever the state does, then we have moral duties to help other people as we can, as we come across them. And to, uh, now, there's some issue with that the if the state takes too much of your resources, you don't have as much left you know, to help out other people that you come across. But uh, I don't, I think that, I think that we should um, not allow the existence of excessive state involvement in certain kinds of things to be an excuse for us for not doing, engaging in the kindly and philanthropic acts that come before us as opportunities every day. I think that that's, you know, it, could, it can be tempting to think, uh, um, to, but isn't to that fall the, into that. Absolutely. But I think my point was more, it crowds out those, looking to the state actually, actually means that we pass by on the other side ourselves. Yes, but I think that there's a distinction between saying, um, we think that the right kind of society is this, and we think that other people ought to think in this way, whether they're Christians or not. I mean, I think that there's only so much Christianizing of the thinking of people who aren't Christians that you can demand of them. Uh, and if they, there's a kind of look to your own house uh, aspect of these things in the first instance, that we, that we need to, we need to do the things which are the right things um, as Christians. And we need to not allow the mistakes of others to be excuses for us not doing the right things uh, as Christians. Um, and you know, I would say, if you want society to, uh, take more Christian attitudes to things, then persuade more people to be Christians. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, I, that's it's a, it's a it's a trite answer, but it doesn't make it any less true. It's a great answer, and uh, on that, I think we'll finish, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed.